أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أولم يتفكروا في أنفسهم ما خلق الله السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إلا بالحق وأجل مسمى وإن كثيرا من الناس بلقاء ربهم لكافرون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم <تصفيق> My respected elders, brothers, sisters, salam alaikum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In our previous discussion, we discussed how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that He's continuously watching over us. And that if you and I want to enter into a state where we are continuously in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not going to be just on our lips. Rather, it's a state that man has to fall into. Anything that you and I do which is confined to our lips and our mind is not a sincere action. A sincere act happens with one's heart. Even when one prays, if they're only praying with their lips, it's very easy for their heart to wander around. And that's why the fifth Imam says only that part of your prayer which you are in the presence of God is accepted, the rest of it is thrown back at you. Man has to realize, as we say in Ayatul Kursi, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نو That drowsiness does not overtake the eye of my Lord Neither does he fall asleep He is continuously watching over me And yesterday we touched upon that one barrier That stops me from remembering God It is when I think that I am When I think I'm something in front of God Then all of a sudden I don't see a need for him In Surah Al-Ikhlas Allah says very clearly Allahu Samad he is the only being that is totally self-sufficient and independent. Everybody else and everything else requires Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their sustenance. In any way, be it the breath that we take, be it the eyes through which we look at, everyone requires God's mercy and grace and God says, I am the only one who is self-sufficient. I touched upon Fir'aun and Musa just as an example yesterday to show us how this pride of man, how it can take him so astray to the extent that he thinks he is the provider. He thinks he is the one to be answerable to. When Pharaoh had the outlook that he had, that everything is under my kingdom, it was because he thought he was something in this world. He felt that he was independent of God. Whereas Allah tells Musa, Musa, despite the fact that you're going against somebody, whose ego is so great, I still want you not to talk to their intellect. I don't want you to try and reason with this person. Because if you try and reason with this person from the onset, if you try and show him that he's actually an individual who just has pride, that man is going to defend himself. But I want you to go and attack his heart. I want you to try and break his heart. If you can do that, then all of a sudden, like the Qur'an says, some hearts, they're harder than rocks. Harder than rocks. But God says, and even from rocks do I bring forth springs and fountains. The cleanest of water will come out of mountains, will it not? This large rock that seems like a mammoth creation in front of us, that we see ourselves as an individual that has no power in front of it, yet God says, if it breaks... 
then from within it, there is still godliness that will come out. There's purity that will come out. So Musa, I want you to speak to him in a fashion which is polite, to try and break and mold his heart. This is where we stopped yesterday, and I said I'll continue with this question as to why God punishes. Why is it that this merciful God, in the mercy that he speaks to us about, like the, you look at the mercy that this God has and you think there cannot be a hell. The only reason I accept that somebody will go to hell is because he has said it in his book. Had he not said it, and had you told me, after everything you know about God, is God, going, uh, is God going to put people in hell? I would have said no. It's not possible with the mercy that we know of God that he would put people in hell. But the, the reality is that it's going to happen. The reality is that there will be people who will go into the hellfire. God says to the extent, خَالِدِينَ fiha abada. Some of them will remain in it forever. There may be a group of people who will perpetually stay in hell. Ah, this doesn't make sense. What sin has man done that the torment, that the punishment is going to last continuously forever. That he's close to death and he gets resurrected again. And again he gets punished and again he comes back. Why is God torturing man? He created me with his own two hands. He says, I'm the closest to him. But yet he punishes man to this extent. God doesn't get anything out of punishment. So why punish man? In the Quran, Allah says, Adabum min ar Rahman. Punishment from the All Merciful. So that means that even his punishment is backed by his mercy. He wants something from those in hell. He wants them to do something, to arrive at a certain state. And as soon as they arrive at this state, that's it, they can exit and they'll go into heaven. There's just one thing that he wants from them. And that is that they submit to God. That they let go of their ego. The whole point of hellfire is to remove man from his ego. And by God, it's easier for man to remove his ego in this life than it is in the next life. Because in the next life, it's done by force. In this life, it's done by choice. When it's done by force, it's not an easy task. Can you imagine people prefer to stay in hell than to accept God and say, God, I surrender to you. You are God. I am your slave. And I submit. They can't say those words. And that's why they run out of hell. And then the angels throw them back in. And then again. And this cycle continues. All they have to do is submit to God. But if they were not accustomed to submitting to God in this life, then they're not going to be accustomed to submitting to God in the next life. If man saw himself as something in this life, that even when he knew what was right, he preferred what was wrong, and he preferred the desire of his own soul and the comfort of his own soul, that man on the day of judgment won't change with the flick of a switch. Sometimes we live in this utopian idea in our heads that when the 12th Imam reappears, I'll be on his side. I'm waiting for his reappearance so that I can accept his call and he will accept me. You think the Imam will say anything different to what you and I know? Will he ask anything of you and me that we don't already know that we should be doing? If the man who cannot prioritize his prayer, how will that individual change when the Imam reappears? The man who cannot part with his wealth because he has to give a large sum before the Khums date, and he thinks that if I wait till my Khums date, I'm going to part with a lot of money, so let me try and use a loophole, which is legal, but I'll try and splash out on a car. At least that way I don't have to pay the khums. <laughs> that man who uses his head to deceive God, that individual, when the imam comes, you think that he's of any use to the imam? Does he have any worth in the eyes of imam? Imam will say the same words that the prophet said. He will say, have taqwa. That's it. He just wants you and I to be God-weary and God-conscious. When we stand in front of God, pride has no position. It has no place. When you stand in front of an oppressor, we're told, at some point, show your pride in front of the oppressor so he doesn't take advantage of you or she doesn't oppress you. Fine. But in front of God, man is nothing. 
Isn't it beautiful that the Holy Prophet would sit in tashahud, the greatest of creation, and he says, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا He says, عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ The first thing that I pride myself with is not that I'm a messenger of God. Rather, the only way I became the messenger of God was that first I became his slave, then I became his messenger. I gave up everything and submitted to him, then only was I elevated to the rank of an individual who can be called a messenger of God. In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is self-sufficient, you and I have no pride. He calls himself Al-Mutakabbir. He says, I am pride in its entirety because I create from nothing, whereas you can't create from anything. Have you noticed our discussion today was going to be about thinking? It's so beautiful in the Quran that Allah doesn't just give you the answer. Sometimes you think, God, you created this book and you sent it down 6,600 odd verses. But sometimes you say things in a very strange fashion. Like you say, I'm going to give you a parable. Or you say, I'm going to give you a story. Why don't you just tell me the conclusion? Why not just tell me short sentences, worship God, don't worship idols, and that's it. That can be the conclusion of the book. Why give me a parable? Why give me a story? Why give me an example? Have you seen what God is doing to the intellect of man? If God just said, worship God, it hasn't taught me and proved anything to me. If God tells me don't worship an idol, he didn't prove to me the weakness of an idol. But when he holds my hand in the Quran and takes me through a guided journey, where he takes me through a parable and an example, I begin to learn for myself and I realize proof and so I accept. Allah makes us question. He asks us, why don't you question? He asks us and tells us, I don't want you to accept a faith without proof for that faith. I want you, O oh man, that when somebody gives you your belief, that you tell them, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ I want you to tell them, bring your proof if you're of the truthful individuals. I don't want you to have blind faith. Because if you have blind faith, then you've built your faith in that upside down pyramid. You just accepted what your parents taught you, what your community taught you without ever questioning. There's a time and place for that. You don't accept, expect the five-year-old to question, the ten-year-old to question. But when that ten-year-old becomes 20 and 30 and 50, you expect that they will question every tenet of their faith so that they can prove it before actually believing in it. Take, for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Idol worshipping. It's in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 73, 2273. He could have just told man, don't worship idols. But instead he holds man's hand and he says, let me take you through a parable where I want you to come to the conclusion yourself. I'll ask you some questions and you answer. Because this man or woman, fully grown adult, goes into a temple looks at an idol that's made out of stone or rock or wood, knows that they funded the creation and the building of this idol, such an intellectual individual, uh, a, an accountant, a teacher, a stay-home mother or father, an intellectual individual goes into this place of worship and all of a sudden prostrates to a piece of wood. What happened to the intellect? Outside, come and look at them when they're working in their businesses. These individuals are sharp cookies. All of a sudden they come into the four walls of this temple and their intellect has become paralyzed because they never questioned and they never thought of the basic tenets of their own faith and belief system. So God says, I'm going to take you on a journey where I want you to question what you're doing. But I'm not just going to give you the result. I'm not just going to tell you this is good for you. I'm going to ask you questions so you come to the conclusion. When you come to the conclusion, you will believe in what you're saying. Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind. This verse is not for ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. It's not for those who believe. It's going to be about idol worshipping. Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind. Imagine the Prophet, wouldn't you love to be alive at the time of the Holy Prophet? Where all of a sudden revelation after revelation comes. At one point, Um Salama comes back from a journey 
She comes and the first thing she asks the women in Medina is, was there any new revelation of the Quran since I've been away? I mean, they were waiting for the Quran to be revealed to them. And they went to the Prophet and they asked, Oh Prophet, and they start conversing until a verse comes down. They were waiting for these verses. Imagine the Prophet just walking into the midst of people in a marketplace, in a mosque. He says, Revelation has come and he begins, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, ضُرِبَ مَثَلٌ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Allah is setting forth a parable, an example, and Allah commands you that now I want you to listen. Be silent. I want you to listen to what's about to be said. In the Ladina, as for those, Tadauna min dunillah, those who call upon other than Allah, Lay Yahluku Dubaban, those individuals, they gather together in their temples and they worship an idol. I'm telling them and I'm questioning them and I'm challenging them that they can't even create a fly. This thing that disturbs them, that when they're worshipping, it comes and sits on their nose and they have to hit it off. God said, that thing that is so small that you can't even catch, that thing you can't even create. But he doesn't stop here. Look at now the intellectual paralysis being undone by God. God now comes to their intellect and begins to shock them. Begins to nurture them. These are polytheists. These are individuals who are worshipping other than God. These are people who are doing shirk. But even God hasn't left them. Until their last breath, God will keep guiding them. So on the day of judgment, they can't stand up and say, God, you didn't guide me. That's what he did to Fir'aun. Hatta idha balagatil hulqum. As he was drowning, until the soul reached his throat. God says, until that time of Fir'aun, I'm going to try and bring you back into my fold. Now he tells those idol worshippers, you can't create this fly, but now let me shock your intellect and I want you to answer a question. He says, وَإِن يَسْلُبُهُمُ الذُّبَابُ شَيْئًا This fly, if it takes something from you, when you go into the temple, you take your milk, you take it in a bowl, you put it in front of this piece of rock, and you give it as a sacrifice, right? God's saying, you know this fly that you are trying to run after and slap and hit and kill? When you stand at a distance and that fly lands into that bowl of milk and it takes a sip of the milk that you've given and is now the property of your Lord and it flies away, Allah says, you're not able to bring it back. He says, oh man, can you see how weak you are? Forget you. Can you see how weak your God is? That you've just given your God a gift and a fly has stolen a sip of the milk. He says, go and bring it back for me. Go and bring it back. Let's see how you are so strong and how strong this God is of yours. And then Allah concludes and He says, weak is the pursuer and the pursued. The one who is calling to this idol is weak and the idol itself is so weak. Now all of a sudden, this idol worshipper is sitting and thinking for himself. Had God just said, oh man, you're weak and your idol's weak. That's how Musa was told, don't go to Fir'aun with pride. If you just come and give, this is the right way, God would have said it's the right way. Idol worshipping is wrong, but you know what the idol worshipper would have done? Would have put up his defense. And said, no, we're right. But instead of doing that, God takes this idol worshipper's hand through a guided journey of intellectual stimulation and says, I just want you to think about the fly. That's it. Nothing more. I'm not going to tell you anything else. If you can't bring back the milk and your God can't bring that back the milk, then you tell me, who is worthy of being worshipped? For you and me, God gives a different example. We don't worship external idols, do we? Thank God we were never tested with that. Imagine being brought up in a culture, a community, a society, a family that only worships idols. Now all of a sudden, you're being told that you know what, this inner calling is telling me this is wrong. You know how much courage it takes for somebody to turn around to their family and say, I'm following a different religion now. I'm involved in a case right now where there is a, a, a Muslim of a different sect and then a brother from our sect. And this sister has decided to follow the path of the Ahlul Bayt. You know what her family told her? They said, we would prefer that you become a Christian or a Jew rather than following that sect. 
Can you imagine the life she's led? Just today I got a phone call that her parents have, this is after maybe six months now of turmoil in her house, her parents have finally accepted that she is following this faith, but her siblings aren't speaking to her. This is difficulty that man is tested with. You and me, we didn't have that challenge. You and me were given this on a silver platter. So you know who's going to be questioned more? Not that individual. You and me. Because when you're giving it to, you're given it on a platter, then your responsibility is greater and so is mine. Here, I'm preaching to the choir. When you leave this mosque, you haven't heard anything which is drastically new. It's a, hopefully a reminder, maybe something that will be inspirational. This isn't the challenge. We're not being tested right now. The test is outside. How many people have you brought onto the right path? How many? Regent's Park Mosque in London, one conversion a week. A week. I'd love to find one of our Hoja communities that has done two a year. Maybe. Maybe we're trying to keep gold dust for ourselves, thinking that if we share it, we will lose out on it. You think you have non-Muslim neighbors because of an accidental cause that you liked the house and you bought it and they liked the house and they bought it? Or is there a reason that they're living next to you? And are you and me going to be questionable on the day of judgment? That I made this individual who was an atheist, who was a disbeliever of God, live next to you so they could see your actions and the way you spoke to your children and that you would speak to them and all of a sudden, you'd say something that might soften their heart. You'll ask them about God in one way or another. Or, oh man, are you not confident in your faith anymore? That on the plane, you don't even want to pray out of fear of what people will think around you. It's as if you've guaranteed the plane journey that you will stay alive when you land, that you tell God, God, I'll pray when I land. He said, this is the test for you. The test for you is not idol worshipping. The test for you is priority. Do you, priority. do you prioritize the eyes of other people? Or do you prioritize me? God says, for you, all believers, I have another parable. Surah Yunus 10, verse 22 to 23. He says, oh mankind, who alladhi, he, he is the one who enables you to travel on the sea until when you're in ships, and you begin to sail, there's a great wind that comes about, you've set sail, calmly you're moving, you rejoice therein. He says, then all of a sudden a storm comes about. Waves begin to hit you left and right. That's the clue. That there comes a time in the storm, at the beginning of the storm, they think they can ride it. They think there's something. God says, so I enrage that storm even more. And then they come to breaking point when they realize, God, now I'm handicapped. God, now I can't control the ship, I can't control this yacht, and I can't control the water. At that point, now all of a sudden, look what happens. Now all of a sudden, they go down on their knees. Now they cry out to God sincerely. They promise God, Oh God, if you bring me to shore, and God, if you bring about ease from me, if you save me min hadhi, from this difficulty, min I promise you that I'm going to be of those who are thankful. Doesn't that happen to you and me? When somebody in the family becomes ill, when all of a sudden work is difficult and we can't make ends meet, when we're paycheck to paycheck, that we turn to God easily, right? And God says, I want to stimulate your intellect a bit. Because man, you've paralyzed it. You think you're going out, you think you're bringing in the money, and that's why you're spending how you want to spend. I've got to put a stop to this. I need you to realize that it's not your money that comes in, it's mine. I need you to realize that these children aren't yours, you can't speak to them how you want. I need you to realize that you've taken your wife or your husband for granted, and the way you speak to them is not what the Quran says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna. Speak of kind words to people. That's not how you're treating her. I need to put a stop. You know what I'll do? I'll make your wife ill. 
I'll make your husband ill. The question at that time, when our spouse is on the brink of death, all of a sudden nobody knows what's wrong with her or him. The question then is not what physical ailment has overtaken them. That's obvious. You and I are going to do that and find out and try and bring some sort of treatment. The question God wants you and I to ask is what does God want from me? What is He testing me? What have I taken for granted that He wants to open my eyes? When my business begins to go downhill, it's not that He wants me to work even more. That's going to happen. I'm going to try and come out of this difficult situation. What He wants from me is to ask, God, what is it that you want from me? What am I doing wrong, God? Why have you brought this test about? Have I taken something for granted? If Allah is continuously making me ask questions, you know what's going to happen to me? I'm going to become a product of my environment. He continuously tells me in the Quran, whenever I open it, He says, have you not thought? Have you not questioned? Do you not ponder? He's forcing me to ask myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start asking questions as well. Oh Allah, is anything off limits when it comes to this religion? Is there something that I'm not allowed to question about? You know who says that you can't question about something? Someone who's afraid of the answer won't allow you to question. As for God, he's the opposite. He says, oh Muhammad, I've revealed this Quran and I challenge everybody, bring another surah that's like it. Oh Muhammad, I'm revealing this Quran to you and its morality is so upright that I tell you, challenge these individuals to mubahila, not a problem. Be certain in what you believe in. Allow people to question. You know when it comes to culture and faith, if you look at what our culture is, what does it comprise of? A culture comprises of our language, our clothing, our food. These things are culture. Religion never falls inside culture. If you think for a moment that my religion is part of my culture, that means the culture is greater than the religion. That means I need to protect the culture at all costs. And if I protect the culture, then the religion will be protected. But it's upside down. God says this culture, everybody needs a culture to act. The food we eat is our culture. The way we sit is our culture. The way we talk is our culture. You need this to interact in society, to be part of a community and congregation. You need a culture. But you know what's greater than the culture? It's the religion. So if you want to protect the culture, you protect the religion. And you know what we'll do? As you protect the religion, those parts of the culture that are in contrast and total opposition with the religion will begin to filter them out. Because you're holding on to Tawheed and you won't allow anything to come inside. I've spoken to you before about simple stuff, which hopefully doesn't ruffle any feathers, but things that we tend to have in our, uh, in our weddings, for example. You know how weddings were. If you look at your parents' videos and when they got married, I mean, you wouldn't see any resemblance to how we're getting married today, right? It seems very much like a, a, a marriage that takes place in India today under the Hindu faith. I remember, and I'm sure you can remember as well, that, uh, <laughs> that gore ceremony. It makes me laugh. I'm so surprised that till today, sometimes it happens. But it just requires a question or two. And thankfully, it's the younger generation that tend to question. And by all means, question. Question everything. I'm going to come to the condition. There's one condition when you and I question. But question. It was so strange that someone was getting married in the family. First time I saw this, and you see that the bride standing in front of you. The first thing is, I'm not mahram to this bride. She's not wearing correct hijab. We'll come to that maybe another day. Now all of a sudden, there's somebody standing with a tray of coins. And they say that this is sadaqah. Yeah, but this is strange. When has God told me, I want you to give sadaqah with somebody else's money? It's like me coming to you and say, sorry, I want to give sadaqah. I put my hand in your pocket, take out a dollar and put it in sadaqah and then tell God I gave sadaqah. It doesn't sit well, right? So I come next to this bride, who I'm a non-mahram of in the first place. I have to pick up coins that aren't even mine. I don't understand the twirling over the head, right? 
But anyway, that takes place. And then you put it in the other tray. And then we gave sadaqah. See, it, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong. Okay? Leave aside the hijab right now. Nothing was wrong. Yes, I gave sadaqah with somebody else's money, so really it wasn't sadaqah. But no problem, I gave sadaqah on Mustafa's behalf. Mustafa, I took his money, I gave sadaqah on his behalf. It doesn't make sense, right? We what the, you know what the problem is? The problem is not the action. The problem is the seed that I've begun to sow in the next generation. That hold on to practices even if they don't make sense. Because our forefathers used to do it. There's nothing wrong in it, so do it. But my intellect's telling me that this doesn't sit with the Qur'an. When Amirul Mu'mineen gave sadaqah at three times, Allah mentions it in the Qur'an. That he gave it in a fashion in public. And he gave it in private. And he gave it in the day. And he gave it in the night. And when I listen to the people of the pulpit, the scholars say that, you know what, that sadaqah that is given in private is the best of sadaqah. When nobody knows what I've given. When I give with my right hand such that my left hand doesn't know. You know when you're walking down the street and you know you've got a few dollars in the pocket and you know that one of those notes is a 20, the rest of them are ones, and you say, you know what, I don't want to look, I just want to give. And I give and I put in the hand of the individual, the next 10 steps are the worst. Because the next 10 steps, I'm saying, I hope it wasn't the 20 that I gave. I hope it was the five, right? God says it was never yours in the first place. You were just a custodian. Have you seen how easy it is for people who are at the top, at the helm of a charity, to give money? Because it's not theirs. So they give it easily. But tell them to give their own money. That's where the test is. Allah says, oh man, you're like that individual who goes to sea. When everything's calm in your life and at ease, you forget me. So I bring about turbulent waters in this life, not because I don't love you, because I love you. Because I want you back. So I bring about these tests and difficulties so that you turn back to me. And then you know what you tell me? You tell me, God, save me and I promise I will change. God, if you cure my wife, I promise I'll wake up for Fajr from tomorrow. God, if you cure my wife, I promise we'll never entertain ourselves in the way that we used to. With the music that we used to listen to. Oh God, those restaurants that we used to go to with our friends and there was alcohol on the table, I promise you that will never happen again. Just cure my wife. God says, but when they come back on shore, they begin to bring about injustice against their own selves. They begin to wrong them own, their own selves. They go against their own selves. Simple parable that God leaves you and I with. So he begins to stimulate the intellect and ask man, what exactly are you doing? My time is up, but I don't want to end until I give you this one condition about questioning. And then we'll continue tomorrow. Tomorrow we're speaking about the Qur'an, hopefully a, um, hopefully a discussion that will make us realize one of the greatest complaints of the Holy Prophet on the Day of Judgment. Anyhow, one condition. Question. Question, but ensure that this one thing is the reason why you're questioning. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 260, when he questions God, God loves the question so much, he puts it in the Qur'an. You think Ibrahim didn't question God throughout his life? He questioned. But this one was singled out. Now Ibrahim turns to God, وَإِذْ قَالَ Ibrahim Rabbi. Ibrahim turns to his Lord, he says, Rabbi, my nurturer, my nourisher, أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى God, I want to see with my own two eyes how you resurrect the dead. Remember what I said at the beginning. That man will only believe when he has proof. That's why God doesn't tell the idol worshipper, you're damned to hell. Rather, he's saying, let me take you on a journey so you begin to question these idols and you find the proof. Ibrahim turns to God and says, oh God, I want to see with these two eyes. How do you resurrect the dead? Allah questions him. One minute, Ibrahim, I want to know why you're questioning. Are you questioning for the sake of questioning? Are you questioning to try and test me? Are you questioning because you just don't like what people are doing? Tell me the reason, O Ibrahim. Qala, awalam tu'min? Ibrahim, are you telling me you don't believe? Ibrahim says, Qala, bala, walakin 
قلبي God, I promise I believe Even if you don't answer, I believe But God, I want certainty That's why I'm questioning The only type of questioning Which God emphasizes and encourages And says, question everything Question God himself People will sit in front of the Prophet and question God. If I can question the existence of God, then there's nothing that I shouldn't be allowed to question. If people hold me back from questioning, that's an indication that there are shaky grounds here and they're afraid of the answer or they don't have the answer. One of the two. But on my journey to God, I'll question with this condition that God, I want certainty in my belief system. And once I achieve certainty, then that's it. Then on the day of judgment, God can take me to task. He said, you knew what was right from wrong, yet you decided to follow your own desires. Inshallah, we will continue tomorrow. Conclusion then from today's discussion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't created us as animals. In the Quran, he's talked about human beings who are like animals. Kal an'am. They like cattle. بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ Rather, they're more astray than animals because they didn't use what I gave them as a differentiating factor between them and a cow. The differentiating factor was that they had a mind and an intellect. The cow didn't. That means that the cow worshipped God perfectly. The cow was told to eat, it ate. Sleep, it slept. Get ready to be killed, it surrendered itself to the knife and it got killed. It did exactly what it was created to. But man, man, I gave you more than the cow. I gave you an intellect, but you didn't use it. So not only are you like the cow, بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ Rather, they're more astray than the cattle themselves. We need to wake up intellectually and question with sincerity. Then only will man have true belief. Then only will man realize what this journey to God is. Why did God create me? I can't understand. At the age of 40, 50, I'm still asking God, what is my purpose? Why create me and him if both of us are doing exactly the same thing on earth? One of us is a waste of space. But God wants him and he wants me. That means you have a different potential, I have a different potential. You have a different task in life, I have a different duty in life. But if I don't ask God, God, why did you create me? What do you want from me? You know what will happen to man? It's that man who at the age of 65 is afraid of retiring. Have you heard the spouse at home saying, I don't want him or her to retire because if they retire, they're going to eat my head if they stay at home. There's only so much gardening they can do, but after that, I don't know what they'll do. That means this individual had one purpose in life. And that was to work. And they worked, and they worked, and they toiled. And after 65 years of working, now they got their time back, but now they don't know what they're meant to do. He says, if I stop working, I'm going to get sick. Did God create you just to work? Really? Or is there something much greater than that? I concluded yesterday by mentioning that Sentence of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Tonight being Thursday night, allow me to elaborate. When Imam Hussein tells Shimur as he attacks the ladies, he tells, turns to Shimur and he says, In lam kun lakum deen. Shimur, if you have no religion, wa kuntum la takhafun al ma'ad. If you don't fear the next life, my advice to you is one. Fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. Be a free man. In this dunya. Shima doesn't understand. Be a free man. Hussein, I am leading an entire army here. I am the one who has been given promises of wealth. I am the one who's winning this battle. Physically, we're winning, Hussein. You're telling me I'm not a free man? Because Shimur, you might be free physically. But Shimur, your mind is a chained is chained at his, as a slave Umar ibn Sa'ad and Yazid you are a slave to your desires can you not see that this same shahada you give in the adhan I am his grandson that when he sat on his chest 
Shimon said, by Allah, I bear witness that you are the grandson of the Holy Prophet. How do you say such a statement? Unless your mind and intellect is chained and paralyzed. Because never for a moment did you stop and think, what is my purpose in life? Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimin. Fasayalamu al-ladheena zalamu ayyamun qalibi yanqalibun. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ridham bi qadaihi wa tasliman li amrih. We end with this dua of sahar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد إلهي وقف السائلون ببابك ولا هذا الفقراء بجنابك ووقفت سفينة المساكين على ساحل بحر جودك وكرمك يرجون الجواز إلى ساحة رحمتك ونعمتك إلهي إن كنت لا تغفر في هذا الشهر الشريف إلا لمن أخلص لك في صيامه وقيامه فما للمذنب المقصر إذا غرق في بحر ذنوبه وآثامه إلهي إن كنت لا ترحم إلا المطيعين فما للعاصين وإن كنت لا تقبل إلا من العاملين فما للمقصرين إلهي ربح الصائمون وفاز القائمون ونجا المخلصون ونحن عبيدك المذنبون فرحمنا برحمتك وأعتقنا من النار بعفوك يا كريم يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين